Hi everyone, this is Mr. Neil Wright, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. This is of a patient who attended today uh, on an emergency appointment and they've been suffering from uh, a left ear infection. This is their left ear, you're seeing on screen at the moment, for the last fortnight. And they visited the um, doctor on a couple of occasions during that time. And initially they were prescribed oral antibiotics. Um, uh, I think it was amoxicillin. And then a week later, they were still symptomatic. So they returned to the doctor who then prescribed some topical eardrops, antibiotic eardrops, ciploflaxanin. And unfortunately, the patient's symptoms are not improving. And they contacted us this morning to see if we can squeeze them in, which we were happy to do today, with it being Christmas. And today was our last day um, before the Christmas break. So the patient came in and they give you a bit of a backstory. So a couple of weeks ago, developed a head cold and a lot of nasal congestion. And subsequently, they felt that their ear was um, blocked and they were suffering from reduced hearing, tinnitus in this ear. So tinnitus um, is a noise that originates with inside the ears or the head and it's not caused by an external stimuli. It can take many different forms. Most people's tinnitus, um, they report and describe it as a ringing or a buzzing noise or a whistling sound in the ear. Uh, but it can literally be any sound, but that, that's the most common one, a high-pitched um, type of sound. Um, some people also experience pulsatile tinnitus, and that can be cardiosynchronous. So it, it's, they can hear the pulse, their, their heartbeat or um, their carotid artery pulse with inside their ear. So that was a patient's symptoms, and so I, I was aware that their left ear was infected. Um, obviously, uh, prior to the patient attending, and uh, before we began the procedure, and uh, before I even looked in the ear, um, I was aware that there it was their left ear that was the main issue. As such, I decided to examine their right ear first because the right ear, the patient didn't complain of any. They were told that they've got wax in the right ear, um, but they, they weren't experiencing any of the symptoms and they weren't told that the right ear was infected. And the reason why I examined the right ear first was if we examined the left ear first, um, we would have to decontaminate the endoscope before examining the right because the um, obviously their ear is infected and we don't want to transfer the infection from one ear to the other. So I decided to look in the better ear first and then we looked in this, their left ear. And then after examining the left ear, we proceeded with the procedure in the left ear. At this particular time, the patient wasn't sure whether they wanted their right ear wax removed because they weren't suffering from any symptoms. Now, from looking at the patient's ear, their left ear, as you can probably tell yourself, it's still infected, it's slightly inflamed. And um, they've got this thick layer of skin that's lining the whole ear canal. And you can see I'm trying to just peel this away. Um, but you may have also noticed the patient's also possibly got these fungal spores, and which means they've got a fungal infection, uh, more specifically Aspergillus niger. Now, if that's the case, uh, and the patient's been prescribed antibiotics uh, and it hasn't responded really, that could explain uh, the reason, because if a patient's got a fungal infection, um, and they're, they're using antibiotics, they, well, the antibiotics are not going to do much for the, for the, with the fungal infection. So I've written to the patient's GP, I've recommended an ear swab, just to confirm, because there were some fungal spores there um, present on the skin. They sometimes, you've got to be careful, they can be sometimes mistaken for um, just dead skin flakes, but to me there were, there were just too many of them all the way around the ear, and they did look like fungal spores, and I've seen these before. The fungal spores can either be white or black, and in this case, they, they were white. So, um, and as mentioned, the patient hasn't really responded to the antibiotics. So, we're into the GP, and in the meantime, they're going to use some antifungal eardrops, which they can actually get over the counter, but I have suggested and recommended that they have an ear swab just to confirm the presence of either a bacterial or fungal infection, so they can receive the appropriate treatment. Um, and I'm just trying to peel this away. I'm going to peel it off the eardrum. So you can see the eardrum, there's some dead skin there. Um, and I'm just slowly but short. I had to introduce some uh, medical grade olive oil spray in here just to soften some of the skin because what has happened with the drops uh, and the antibiotics they've given, it's, it's actually caused um, some of the skin to crystallise, which uh, can make it quite difficult to remove, actually, because it's embedded on the, 
uh, on the canal wall and the eardrum. Now, I suspect the patient has been using a cotton bud as well because um, when they first developed the symptoms at the top, you can see there's a bit of dry blood there. So I suspect they've had some trauma. Now, in addition to their outer ear infection, which we call um, otitis externa, this patient has also got acute otitis media. So otitis media is the medical term for an infection of the middle ear. And the middle ear is the space behind the eardrum, so the cavity behind the eardrum. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So what I'm trying to do at the moment is just suction some excess oil. And I'm now going to go back in again. I'm going to start peeling this away from the eardrum. So this is where it gets a bit more tricky and a bit more complex and where the, your hand needs to be really, really steady. So you can see the technique that I'm using. I've actually inserted the endoscope first and I've used the endoscope to straighten this ear canal because it was quite a uh, twisty and bendy ear canal. And once I had straightened the ear canal using the endoscope, I then introduced the instrument into the ear. And when we introduce the instrument in the ear, we just don't do it blindly. We don't just kind of poke it into the ear. We, I use a technique that I've developed where I examine the inside of the ear whilst the endoscope is inside the ear. So I've got to keep that endoscope extremely still and stationary. And I then um, find the tip of the endoscope and I direct the instrument towards the tip. This is using uh, my naked eye, looking inside the ear. And that ensures, you can see that how bendy that ear is. So I'm just stretching the ear open again. And I'm now going to insert the instrument into the ear over the endoscope. And I'm using the tip of the endoscope as a guide. And that ensures the instrument goes straight into the ear. So we're not going to touch the side of the ear canal walls. So it's a safe entry. But what that technique does, especially when we're doing the left ear, it prevents the crossing over of your endoscope hand and the instrument hand and if those hands overlap when you go around the second bend you lose control of the instrument and it becomes wobbly in the ear and especially when you're trying to remove debris from the front part of the eardrum that's the difficult bit where the bend is on the left in the corner of the eardrum um, that makes it so we're now focusing on that part so you can see I'm leading with the the endoscope the endoscope goes in first whatever I do the endoscope always goes in first in, a, in the case of a bendy ear canal. And as I said, that just helps to stabilise the endoscope, stabilise the, the, the instruments I've got full control and the hands are not crossing over. And it will also allows me to go further into the endoscope because if there's a crossover between the instrument and the endoscope, which would be the case if the instrument goes in first. So the reason why I'm talking some of this technical jargon is I do have a lot of specialists that who have trained in the past who watch in fact, I've received a lovely email from one of those specialists we trained many years ago, just this morning, um, saying how much they enjoy the technical aspect as well when I explain it. So that's the, sorry if I'm boring some people, but uh, it's always a good opportunity to explain the technical side. So if in a narrow and bendy ear canal like this, you lead with the instrument and you follow the instrument with the endoscope, there'll become a point where the endoscope and instrument overlap, they, they cross over and it prevents you from further inserting the endoscope and if you can't end, insert the endoscope any further, you don't get the depth perception because the endoscope's too far away and you're working from a distance. And so that's vitally important. So this is the difficult region. Um, and I'm just trying to peel this dead skin away. And you can see what I've done with the tip of the endoscope. I've actually angled it in the opposite direction, which means I'm, I'm gently sliding the instrument across the patient's ear canal but because the tip is angled away from the canal wall itself it it's less contact and it's way more comfortable so that's another kind of thing that I just recently developed um, I would typically bend the tip in the opposite direction towards the canal but when you're working at the front part of the ear canal in the left ear you're more likely to kind of stab into it so I mean there is still times I do angle it towards it but when I'm working really close to the canal and I'm angling it away so we're getting there we can see there's still a bit of debris there at the top of the eardrum and in this region here this is the difficult region the anterior recess and we have to have con complete control of the instrument here because if we lose it we're so close to the eardrum we could perforate it quite easily and or poke into the canal wall, which would be really, really uncomfortable. So whilst you're watching that, I'm just gonna, uh, you're just gonna see me clear all this debris, so, and including that crusted blood at the top of the ear. So whilst you're watching that, I'm just gonna explain what um, otitis media is. So behind the eardrum, uh, we call it the middle ear cavity. Um, the middle ear cavity should be air filled, and um, the air pressure behind the eardrum should be equal to the air pressure 
um, in the atmosphere, so in the air canal. So when the air pressure is equal either side of the eardrum, that's when the eardrum is most mobile and most compliant, and that's when we hear the best. So we, we need to ensure the pressure behind the, ear, the eardrum is always equalised to the air pressure in the um, atmosphere. And there's a narrow tube called the eustachian tube, which connects um, the, the middle ear, so the cavity behind the eardrum, to the back of the nose. And it's called the eustachian tube, so it's a really narrow um, orifice, about eight centimetres in length, approximately, and about four to six millimetres wide, I believe. And the eustachian tube, where it connects to the back of the nose, and more specifically the nasopharynx, it's actually, un under resting conditions, shut. But during the course of the day, uh, when you swallow, yawn or chew, the muscles either side of the eustachian tube, where it connects to the back of the nose, they contract. And that contraction causes the eustachian tube to momentarily open. And when the eustachian tube momentarily opens, the air pressure can equalise. So if there's too much air pressure behind the eardrum, the eustachian tube will allow air to exit the middle ear. And if there's not enough air pressure behind the eardrum, the eustachian tube will allow air to enter up the eustachian tube and fill up the uh, middle ear cavity. Um, the eustachian tube also, however, acts as a drain pipe. So any fluid that's secreted by the cells in the middle ear, it can drain and trickle out of the middle ear, uh, middle ear via the eustachian tubes. Because as I said, we want the, the middle ear to be full of air. So if this eustachian tube gets blocked, and the most common reason why it gets blocked uh, is if you've got a blocked nose. So if you've got congestion at the back of your nose for whatever reason, if it's a head cold or uh, you suffer from rhinitis or sinitis, or sometimes if you've got uh, obstruction, so nasal polyps or adenoids, um, enlarged turbinates or deviated septum, all these things can cause the eustachian tube can get blocked. Um, so if you've got some mucus there, and if the eustachian tube is blocked, it no longer opens when you sw swallow, yawn or chew. And therefore, there's a, an absence of air. So any air that remains in the middle ear soon gets absorbed by all the cells in the middle ear. And then there's a shortage of air. And that creates a, a vacuum effect. And when there's a vacuum effect behind the eardrum, the eardrum gets sucked in, just like you're on a plane. So you can see here now, I'm just trying to peel away this crusted uh, bl uh, blood and dead skin at the top of the eardrum. Um, so the eardrum gets sucked inwards and your, your ears feel blocked and it feels like you're in a plane. And if this eustachian tube is not able to uh, resolve itself and unblock itself, then fluid that would normally drain out of the middle ear, middle ear starts to collect behind the eardrum. And instead of air, soon, soon enough, the middle ear is full of fluid. And we call that middle ear effusion. So effusion is the medical term for fluid. If that middle ear effusion continues to develop and it, it can't, still drain, it gets infected, that fluid, and it turns into glue ear. That fluid turns very thick and glue-like, hence the name glue ear. We call that acute otitis media. And then the middle ear becomes full of fluid, just like a, a water balloon. And eventually, if that fluid and glue ear can't drain, it's going to burst like a, a water balloon would, and it will cause the eardrum to rupture, and you'll, you'll have discharge in the ear canal. Now, if you look at the eardrum, you can see it's very dull. Uh, it's uh, very inflamed, especially where I'm working now, and it's very bold. So you can actually see the buildup of fluid behind this eardrum, and it's it is infected this the middle ear. So the patient is not only suffering from an outer infection; they're also suffering from a middle ear infection. I think that's um, where uh, unfortunately it's, it's not been fully diagnosed. Um, so the patient needs to um, have their middle ear treated as well. So it's just a bit of skin there, I just want to see if it peels away. And you can see where I'm working now, the eardrum is very bulged, you can see all the, the, the blood vessels dilated, so we've got vascularis there, which is always a, a telltale sign of an infection. So I've cleared all the bits around the eardrum, the difficult bits, I'm just mopping up now some dead skin on the back canal wall whilst we're here, let's just get this out for the patient. So I recommended patient for the ear canal, some antifungal drops, but also ask the GP to perform an ear swab to, just, to, just to confirm whether or not the patient's got a bacterial or, uh, or a fungal infection. Um, in terms of the middle ear, the patient's going to use some nasal decongestions. So they're going to use uh, the Otovent nasal balloon um, and they're going to perform some steaming therapy. So they're going to get some hot water in a bowl and put some eucalyptus drops or menthol crystals into the water 
put a towel over their head and inhale the steam and that will give some temporary relief. It'll help clear the nasal passages and help the eustachian tube to open, even if for a short while. So just in just dead skin here, I just want to see if I can get this away. We've, we've done so much, I just, the patient was so still and, and these are all bonus bits. I wouldn't, if the patient wasn't still and if I didn't feel comfortable removing it, I wouldn't have attempted it, but I felt really comfortable in the patient's ear and the patient was really, really still. So really pleased with that. You can see the, the bulging of the eardrum, especially at the top and to the right hand side. It's very dull in appearance. And this is how we started. Just to refresh a moment, this is how we complete. As you can see the difference, the transformation. Now this is their right ear. So what I now had to do before I started the treatment in the right ear is the patient then at this stage decided that they want their right ear cleaned as well. So I completely decontaminated the endoscope. So we use a high level disinfectant, um, which has been uh, com uh, by compatibility tested with our endoscope. And um, we allow the endoscope to be decontaminated before we enter. All the instruments are new. We're not using the same instruments. Everything was wiped down on a medical trolley as well. Fresh gloves. Because we do not want to transfer the infection from the patient's left ear into this right ear. And this was, you can see it's a more dead skin. It's formed into a plug. It's quite a narrow ear. So I'm just trying to tease this out of the patient's ear canal and giving it a good wriggle. And it's almost out. And this is their healthy ear. You'll see in a moment a nice healthy eardrum. So that's a textbook eardrum. That's what the left eardrum should look like. Even in the ear canal, you can see by the colour it's more pink. There's the left ear is angry. It's more red. It's more inflamed. Just some crusted skin on the, um, the second. This is the second bend here. Uh, just before the second bend. So I'm just using a Jobson horn just to lightly um, hover over the surface of the, the canal wall just to loosen this dead skin. There's just a little bit left there, we'll get that out for the patient. Because we're not going too deep, I can actually lead with the instrument here. It's just when you're going past the second bend that you need to have the instrument in first. And you're gonna have a good view of the eardrum. So I hope you enjoyed that video guys. Uh, it's probably going to be the last one till after Christmas. Uh, wishing you all a very, very Merry Christmas. Uh, I hope Santa gets you exactly what you wanted. Uh, uh, enjoy yourselves and we shall speak soon. Thank you. Bye.